Guitar player is James Anthony. He is today's guest on Guitar Players in Isolation. If you are turning back to my channel, thanks so much for your support. If this is the first video of mine that you're seeing, I hope you like it. And if you do, check around. This is the 10th interview on my series, so there's lots more for you to watch. And if you like it, please subscribe to the channel. So let's talk with James. James, how are you? I'm great. A lovely night to be stuck in the basement. Excellent. Yes, I've been living most of this COVID time myself in the basement. Couch TV and guitar. <laughs> well, it's a good thing we have man caves because you need to have that just to survive. You got to have that little studio in the basement. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. You just got to stay out of everybody's hair. That's how you. That's how you keep oh. sanity. <laughs> well, James, before the lockdown, you've been pretty busy with uh, three house gigs in the city: uh, the Uptown Social, Abbey Arms, and the Falcon Brewery. And a lot of these, uh, you run it with guests, right? Right. Well, what happened was uh, I was on the road pretty ferociously till about 2007. Uh, at the, at 2007, I was in Ireland. I was there for about three and a half weeks on tour. That was a bad year for me because in 2006, Denny Doherty passed away. And then I, I just got the gig with Johnny Johnston, who was uh, the piano player for Chuck Berry back in the day. Okay. And I just got that gig, and we were talking about going on tour. We were talking about going to England and doing that whole, you know, he was huge over there. And then he passed away. So here I am in Ireland. Everything ended, and I had to come home. I had like 600 bucks, no gigs, nothing. So I walked into some corner bars and said, hey, you know, you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I'll tell you what. Let me do Thursday night. I'll do a jam night. Give me Saturday afternoon, I'll get a three-piece band together. We'll bring in a special guest every week, and I'll pack the place. And I don't know, <laughs> I, put, I put my foot in front of me, that one. But anyway, uh, I did it. It took. I went around town, and I worked like a mad dog. I put posters up everywhere. I did all the media I could. And it took about, about a month, but I got all those places going. And now I've got, well, up until this, I had a Thursday night, acoustic night with a guest it was like me and wendell or you know one of you guys yeah, yeah, yeah. it was great and then um and by the way old guy hours it was always like seven to ten <laughs> old, uh, guy hours. old guy hours listen, that hey, makes listen sense. Yeah, i'm not yeah. playing from 10 to 2 anymore no. anywhere <laughs> not doing it who do you know <laughs> honest to god who do you know that you want to talk to who's out at two in the morning <laughs> yeah. nobody no. all my friends go home at 11 right and those gigs <laughs> and when those gigs start at 10 you're exhausted for the first song you're done. You're done. <laughs> so anyway friday night i've been doing fine dining where I got my big arch top and I go into a really nice restaurant, you know, seven to 10, same thing, play some jazz tunes, old country tunes, just basically wallpaper. Saturday afternoon, I have the band with the guests. Saturday night, fine dining. Sundays, I was at Abbey Arms and same thing, three to seven, bring in a special guest every week. Hey, it was going great. I mean, almost two years, packed, every, almost packed every time we played. I, I couldn't ask for more. And yeah. I didn't want to go on the road anymore. I was on the road all my life. That guest model really works. I mean, my other guest, Ian McNally, uh, who's out in the Woodstock area, he uh, does a thing called Ian and Friends, where he has guests every week. And then, like I've mentioned before in other interviews, uh, Lou Moore up in Newmarket, uh, he had his uh, Thursday night thing every week, and every week he'd be a guest. I'm pretty sure you were a guest, too. But that's that's kind of where I met a lot of these amazing guitar players that have been guests on this uh, program. It's wonderful. You know what's really funny about it? If people miss one of your gigs, they apologize. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. They go up to you, hey, man, I'm really sorry I didn't make it last week. My uncle died. 
You're going, hey, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> Well, I've seen through your Facebook posts, you've had a lot of great guests, um, Donnie Meeker, George Oliver, and like we've already said, uh, Wendell Ferguson. Um, what are some other guests, uh, some names that you could share with us? Well, over the years, I've been doing this guest thing 17 years now, on and off. I mean, we, we did, even before I went on the road, I, I always had a, a Saturday matinee or a Sunday matinee somewhere, because it was basically, when I got out of Lulu's in 97, 98, um, I wanted to be basically copy that formula. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we couldn't afford a nine piece band <laughs> and bring in, you know, and bring in Sam and Dave, you know, we don't have 150 grand, but, but we could bring in, you know, I got Bucky Berger and James Rasmussen, a couple of the best guys around, around town. Uh, we bring in, you know, all the top R and B, uh, country guys, you know, I had Lou in there of Wendell's been in there, all the guys, you know. Uh, we bring we brought in guys from uh, Harmonica Shop in Detroit. Oh man, I brought in Jack Civiletto from Buffalo. I mean, all the guitar player blues guys that I really enjoy playing with. I brought them all in over the years, and they've all enjoyed it. We and we get them we get them a meal, we pay them, and sometimes we get them a hotel, and then they stay overnight, and they can do the Saturday and the Sunday, and they they can basically it takes a little bit off the traveling. They can stay overnight, have some fun, get up in the morning do another matinee and then go home and everybody's happy, you know? Well, let's go back to the beginning. You've been playing live music a long time from your uh, bio. I see you started at a young age. So when, when did you actually start gigging? I was 12 when I was playing for money. I was playing like the Islington uh, 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 Legion over on Islington Avenue there. We were playing school dances, church basement dances, making like 20 bucks. I, I did that when I was 12, 13 years old, well, you know. Okay. You were playing with uh, Jay Douglas, like, in kind of when you were, like, 15, 16. And, um, 16, yeah. Jay Douglas, for those that don't know, was probably one of the first doing reggae in Canada. Um, he had a band called the Cougars. Um, so, James, you know, being an Italian boy, how did you get hooked up playing reggae before we even called it reggae? <laughs> the law back then was if you had an eight-piece black band, you had had to have one white guitar player in the band. <laughs> I don't know why. But anyway, what happened was I was about 16, uh, 17. My old man walked into my bedroom and he said, me and your mom are moving. What are you going to do? And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> so uh, I answered the paper. It was a little ad in the Toronto Star in the classifieds. It said, wanted guitar player, must travel. Play, you know, soul, rhythm and blues, R&B. Okay, great. So I called the ad and I went down to some little dumpy place on St. Clair somewhere. There was a bunch of guys all hanging out there. You know, when most most of the, uh, the soul players in Toronto were from the West Indies. Mm. Like, it's not like, it wasn't like Detroit where, you know, everybody's from the South. They, these guys were all East, you know, like, uh, West Indian. We, we played, a, they played a bunch of reggae. It wasn't called reggae yet. It was called Blue Beat or something back then. But mm. ska, it was reggae, ska, calypso. And then they played R&B. And they asked me, uh, if I could play shaft on the wah wah pedal, I went, <laughs> that was the test, eh? <laughs> yeah, wah, wah, you know, you know the wah wah thing on shaft. Yeah, yeah. so I, I got the gig. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm in a car or a van with eight guys going to wah wah. So four years, four years of playing reggae, R and B, and soul with Jay and a bunch of guys. So it must have been really unique at the time because, yeah, reggae wasn't really a popular thing yet, especially here in Canada. Um, because what you're talking about is even pre-Bob Marley. I, I really think I was one of the first guys to play reggae, because this is 71 now you're talking, 72. Bob Marley wasn't popular until 75. You know, like he came out later on because of Eric Clapton with I Shot the Sheriff and all that. But we were doing reggae back then, and wow. we, became, we became kind of like the wrecking crew. Uh, we would go into these little, little studios on Queen Street, and you couldn't see through the weed. I mean, everybody was just always like, <laughs> and, they, and they didn't smoke a joint. They smoked something like this you know, about, about 90 times a day. And I'm in there, I'm in there playing like, you know, the reggae rhythm stuff. And uh, I had to make stuff up because I never, I didn't know what I was doing. We we're all just making this stuff up all the time. But it, 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 it was an, an amazing experience because I was on the bottom you know, the ground floor of, of reggae music before it got popular. Yeah. The term reggae wasn't even wasn't even actually used to describe it at that point? No, not yet. Oh, I didn't know that. No, it came out later. 
No, we used to back up. But we used to play the Caravana. We used to back up all the Jamaican artists that came over. We would they put a little band together and we would do the Caravana thing. We'd back all. We'd had to learn like you know twenty thirty tunes and back up all these soul and calypso artists and stuff for the afternoon. I mean, like you said, you were pretty young when you started with Jay Douglas. You know, so it wasn't that much longer before that you kind of got started on guitar. And your hero at the time was uh, was Roy Clark. So you kind of went from country to reggae. So how did you know how did that happen? Yeah, I know. But anyway, <laughs> I fell into it later. But my dad uh, uh, used to have an old tube record player, and all he listened to was opera and country. Hmm. I grew up listening to opera and country. A lot of country swing. Jim Reeves. Oh, man, he liked uh, all that old, old like Hank Williams stuff. And I, I grew up listening to that. Hmm. So, you know, when you're a middle-class Italian guy from Etobicoke, that wasn't cool. That was not cool. <laughs> we, wanted to, we wanted to play soul music, and, you know, I wanted to play Sam and Dave when I, when I came up. Then, But what happened was, after the reggae thing, I, you know, I played in some high school bands and soul bands, and then I, I got the gig with Jay, and that was full-time. I went on the road full-time. When I came back from that, I ended up with a guy named um, James Ackroyd. Now, James Ackroyd was originally James and the Good Brothers. They played on that festival train. But no relation that. to the, the Good Brothers, the country. The yeah. Country thing. Oh, yeah. okay. The same one. James Ackroyd, and the, it was James and the Good Brothers. Gotcha, gotcha. So after the reggae thing was over for me, I jumped into James's band. Uh, and Al Duffy, the bass player, plays with Jack DeKaiser. He was in that band with me. Hmm. And I remember the drummer, big tall guy. Guy was so tall, man. He got behind a drum kit and I looked like a little tiny toy kit behind the guy. <laughs> anyway, we used to play the Hillsburg Bluegrass Festival. And I got into playing country and bluegrass. Oh, okay. Yeah, like country and bluegrass. Um, did that for a short while. 74, 75, I, I ended up with Patricia Dahlquist, who had a Juno Award. Right, and right. For a while. Did the did the funk thing for a while again and uh, ended up in Mondo Combo uh, till about 1980, 81. And then I got this phone call to answer your question. I got this phone call. Al Gain was a steel player. Uh, he, he played with the Good Brothers and everybody else. And he had a gig over at a place called the Heritage Inn in Rexdale. And they were bringing in all the up and coming Nashville country stars. And he phoned me up one day and he said, I got this gig if you want to do it. It's, you know, backing up all the country singers. I went, yeah, it was a great gig. It was like three nights a week. So I took that gig for a year. And uh, the only stipulation is I had to get rid of the Les Paul and the Marshall. <laughs> and I had to get, I had to get a Tally and a, and a Fender Twin. So that's what I did. I bought a, yeah. I bought a Fender Twin and a Tally. And I, and I went back to my country roots and I played with Al for a, a good year there. So I ended up and doing country for a good ten years. Play with uh, Ronnie Prophet's band Shotgun. We backed up um, Michelle Wright. We backed up everybody, but they were all. You have to remember this is a long time ago. They were all just starting out. Right, so right. We were backing up everybody that was starting out. We were starting out. You know. Sounds like your career was uh, was very similar and probably overlapping the same time uh, with Wendell Ferguson. The same thing happened to him. He was. Um, leading a lot of backup bands. So that's, you know, the similarity too is, uh, you know, you did the CFGM Opry North radio show. Um, and I know that he was involved. I don't even know if it was the same one, but he was involved with one too. And that, that where you got a lot of exposure and backing up a lot of these big name artists. In those days, Pepe Francis was, was the top guy. Then there was Albert, Albert McDonald and Wendell. And the work that Pepe didn't get, he threw at Albert, and Albert would throw it to Wendell and me. I ended up getting more work doing what those guys couldn't do. <laughs> yeah, well, I, worked, I worked like seven nights a week, you know, doing, doing what those guys couldn't accept. Wow. And then I got lucky. Uh, Pat Riccio from Anne Marie's uh, band called me, and I, I started getting into doing a lot of sessions through him. I'm th that was an amazing 10 years. I mean, I worked a lot all the time. You know, I got to, I got to play with people like Lynn Anderson and, you know, you name it. Like, we backed them up. This was the time period when you were doing the uh, CFJM um, Opry North radio show, right? Same time. Okay. 80, 80s. That oh, okay. was in the 80s. All through the 80s, I did the country thing. So another part of your backup career was uh, being in the house band at Lulu. How did you dovetail into that? 89. I was playing at a club. I had a house gig. I was there for a year. 
and this is a great story because the keyboard player said to me, what kind of music do you like to play? I said, I don't know. I like everything. I do. I like, I, you know, I like everything from uh, bluegrass to, you know, to jazz to, he said, well, no, he said, seriously, what do you really, really want to play? I said, well, I always kind of go back to my, uh, my R and B roots. I can't help it. Right. Right. He said, you're fired. <laughs> he fired me. So this is two <laughs> weeks before Christmas. Uh, uh, in 1989, I had no gig. I, I, I just, I, I had a kid on the way. It was like, oh no, what do you do? Like I was losing it. I didn't know what to do. Two weeks. That was kind of cold. That was very <laughs> cold. So anyway, I had New Year's Eve booked and everything. Now I've got nothing. The phone call came in. They said, hey, the guitar player Lulu's is leaving. Uh, are you interested in? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So I, I went down there audition and I got the gig. I was there till almost the end of the 90s. That was a great place. I mean, uh, yeah. it was an old uh, grocery store, right? Oh, it was, it was like a Walmart with a stage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We backed up probably everybody you ever saw in Ed Sullivan back to the, the 60s. and Right, like uh, some of the names there were uh, Sam and Dave, the Ohio players, Benny King, Paul Revere's. All of them. All of them, yeah. You know, that was pretty cool. Anyway. career timeline similar to my last guest which was Colin Linden he had a big event in his life that uh, happened at the Colonial Tavern in Toronto and so did you uh, at the Colonial Tavern in Toronto uh, you jammed with Rick James so uh, tell us tell us about that story well what happened was I was in a funk band in uh, 75 or 76 it was called uh, Ebony Jam <laughs> Charlotte Martin was a lead singer she was kind of like Chaka Khan you know, Aretha Franklin kind of, you know, really pretty black girl, did all did all the moves, really, really good. And uh, had a great band. We had three horns, B3, the whole nine yards. Rick used to hang around the bar, and, and he'd come into the club ball. every time we played around. He would, and he asked me to, to go to the States with him, and I, I, I turned it down. I just didn't. I just got a gut feeling. I, I didn't feel <laughs> right about it. And you know what happened? He took the whole band to L.A., they rehearsed for two weeks. He put them up in a hotel. He took off with the record money and never paid anybody. And they all had to, they all had to get day jobs to come back. So that's how bad I would have been in. Wow. So my gut feeling, man, has always been really good. I'm lucky. I got that gypsy thing. I can just I just feel things aren't right. You know. Like was that to record like his big hits or was that before or after like super just freak and before. just before. Just yeah. <laughs> so he wasn't huge yet. He was getting the record money, the advance yeah. money. But, yeah. But he, anyway, all the Canadian guys ended up coming home. <laughs> Poor guys. <laughs> I know. So we mentioned this before, but I didn't ask a question on it. Tell us a little bit more about that Opry North radio show for uh, CFGM, uh, because the list of guys that you were backing up were were pretty incredible. Uh, Ricky Skaggs, Alabama, Tommy Hunter, Dan Seals, Sawyer Brown. So share with us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was at the Masonic Temple. And I, I, I actually didn't know how to take this because I was hired to be the acoustic rhythm player. Okay. I, I have my big Martin D, uh, D35, and I was in the corner with playing my Martin. I was getting frustrated because <laughs> I was going, well, I, know, I, don't get the, I don't get to do all the cool stuff. I got to be the, you know, the CG, CGDF guy all night. And then Albert put me straight one day. He said, man, he said, Anybody can play solos, but, you know, not everybody's a good rhythm player. He said, I hired you because you, he says, I thought you were, like, the best rhythm player I, I, I know around, and I needed a good rhythm player to hold it down. And then I went, okay, and my, my, I puffed my chest out. <laughs> after that, you know. Who was playing a lead in that band then? Whoever, whoever. Oh, okay, it was a yeah. moving chair. Yeah, sometimes. So how did the preparation go for, for backing up these artists, like whether it was at the uh, – 
the Opry North radio uh, program or at Lulu. So what was the process for for learning the show before you know the the star showed up? Well, a lot of the, a lot of the stars bring in uh, an MD, musical director. Right. This is the thing at Lulu's. They would bring in their MD guy, and he would be the one that kind of rehearsed the band and, and showed us the ropes. Like we would have to learn maybe 25, 30 songs, and we would get we would show up at four o'clock. Same with Opry North. They show up at three, and then you rehearse for like two and a half hours, and you go through intros, endings, and then you had to make little notes on the charts, and the charts were so written on, like so many notes were made on these photocopies that you couldn't even read them anymore. <laughs> like they were horrible, but you had to make your own, make your own little little notes out, and then, uh, you know, you, you pretty much had to play the whole night and not make a mistake, or they kill you. Like you, Lulu's was a lot of pressure. So is that. You would be sweating because you'd be in the middle mm-hmm. of a show and you can't mess up. Right, I don't right. know how I did it. I don't know if I could do it now, but yeah. when you're 30 years old, man, you can you can do a lot of stuff. You know. Who else yeah. was in that uh, house band? There were some pretty big players in that band. Well, Ron Dan was a steel player. Ed White on drums, Albert McDonald on guitar most of the time. Oh, it, it went through some. I didn't play them all. I did a few. You know, like it, it changed. It went through changes, yeah. depending on your availability. Like if you were on on the road and one of them came up, you couldn't do it. You know, right, right. They, they just get somebody else. Any cool stories you can share with some of the guys you backed up? Got to be some fun stories. Well, some. I don't want to say the bad ones, <laughs> but the good ones. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember a guy named Ronnie Dove? Is he wrote a song called Right or Wrong? That was the most generous guy I ever met because how many people have you ever backed up that they thank you at the end of the night, everything's cool, you learn the material, they thank you. You basically work like about four days learning the material. You spend a lot of time because you want you want to do a good job. You want to sure. this is a gig. At the end of the night, he, he shows up with, uh, uh, you know, Crown Royal. He had a case of Crown Royal and he gave everybody a great big bottle and said, thank you. Hmm. He's the only guy in my whole career. I backed up millions of guys. And that's the only guy that's ever done anything like that. Actually gave you a thank you bottle of rye. I thought that was beautiful. Most of those singer guys should learn from that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, at the mon- look at the money they're making. They're getting 10 grand for an hour, and you're getting like three. You're getting 300 or 350. <laughs> this is why a lot of uh, – being a sideman is so hard because you really never make a lot of money. Even when you're with a really big guy – you're still making scale or whatever the standard wage is. The way you're going to ever make any real dough is you either got to write a song or you got to be the front guy. And you had to put all the work in to, uh, to learn a set. Oh, God. Lulu's was uh, one of the toughest gigs I've ever done because it was just grueling. It was a machine. Like, you learned all the material. And you have to remember, back then, you didn't have YouTube. You didn't have the right. internet. Yeah. Now, if somebody was coming in, you had to go out and buy their record or find out or get a copy of something. And uh, if you were lucky, the musical director would give you a, a call or an email and say, we're learning these 25 songs. Here are the keys that are in. Right. Most of the time, they didn't bother. So you showed up at these at these rehearsals cold and had to read the charts and get through the whole thing. And then at the end of the night, your friggin' brain was going like this, you know. So there was no no train wrecks? Uh, a couple. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, we're... we're we're all good. We call it skating. We, we're all good skaters. Sure, sure. If, even if, 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 I'm, if I blow something really bad, I'll dance around, act like an idiot or something. I don't know. You know, yeah, yeah. there's ways of covering it up. This is the only thing that a lot of guys are fun to play with in my career. I, there was a lot of really fun players. But some guys got cranky. And if you made a mistake, man, they give you the daggers. And yeah. you, you feel about this big for about an hour. <laughs> that look. Oh, God, yeah. The one that you're watching, you know. You know. I met you, James, through uh, through your music store in Cambridge. So uh, you were operating a store. From meeting you there, I recognized you on TV because I think it was around shortly after that period, you had a, a show on Roger's Cable called uh, The Midnight Hour, and I think that lasted for a while. So so if you could, touch a bit on your TV show and uh, you know running music stores. When I got the Lulu's gig, I moved to Cambridge, and I was lucky enough to meet a gentleman in town 
whose mother owned the whole downtown block. Hmm. And we became uh, we became friends. And there was a little store that nobody seemed to be able to make it work. Like there was a shoe store, there was a jewelry store. And, and every time anybody rented the store, a month or two later, they, they closed the doors. We uh, we opened up a little guitar repair shop, and I loved I loved that. I was in there tinkering around all day, and I got to meet some cool people. I did that store for about seven years straight. Hmm. And then the vintage thing was really, really going well around that time. Like you could find, you could find a lot of old guitars really cheap still. That was early nineties. Mm-hmm. It didn't get out of hand until the later nineties where strats went from, you know, 800 bucks to 20,000, you know, that, that happened kind of overnight. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't remember the exact time that happened, but I was there and, and a lot of the guitars that I, I, I wish I kept a lot of, I mean, I had some beautiful guitars back then. Still do, but yeah, yeah. You know, we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. The store was great. I did that, and then I, while I had the store, I also had Lulu's on weekends. I had a house gig on Tuesday nights. I had another house gig on Sundays that I, I had the band with a guest, and I had my TV show that was being filmed um, twice a month, and it was on for five years. We won an award on, uh, we won the the best cable music show award. Then AT&T came in and bought Rogers, and we all got fired. This is the story of my life. Things are going really, really well. And, and they're going so well, you can't believe it. The next day you get a phone call, it's over. You know? It happens so many times, you know? Well, similar to your house gigs now, um, the model was the same. You had uh, lots of guests on that uh, TV show. Um, do you remember some of the guests you had on there? Was I had there- all the singers from Downchild, like The Hawk, Chuck Jackson, Tony Flame. I had all those guys. I had a lot of female singers. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, Harrison Kennedy back then, Eugene Smith, all the who and who R&B kind of guys. Oh, I had some country guys on there too, but I can't remember. Well, you're going back, you know, but yeah. it was a- it was a really cool show, and I did it again when I moved. Yeah, to- with with Kojiko, right? But it failed miserably here. Nobody cared. Nobody wanted to give me any. Nobody wanted to sponsor it. Right, so right. I should, uh, you know, <laughs> gave up. Nobody wanted to do it. At the top of the interview, you mentioned it passing. Uh, you were working with uh, Denny Doherty, you know, who, who had, I guess passed away at the time, which kind of blew the tour for you. He was a founding member of the Mamas and the Papas. You did a lot of work with him. You did some writing too. Yes. But I played on and off with him. Well, in 1986, I got a call to do a session in, in Mississauga, a place called Heart Studios. A buddy of mine ran it, and uh, I went in there one day, and I was playing mandolin and doing my dobro thing and doing all my stuff, you know, because I, I, I had a pretty good thing going. They could hire me. They wouldn't have to hire four guys, and I'd go in. <laughs> I play a, a bad banjo part, you know. I put on some dobro, some mandolin, a little, a little guitar, a little rhythm, and I fill it up. Sometimes bass. So that you know, one shot I went in and played everything, and uh, he came walking in. It was in the middle of the winter, and he came walking. In, he had snow all over him, and he sat there and watched me for about half an hour. And I went over during the break, and I shook his hand. Said so I didn't know who he was. Yeah. I just said, "How you doing?" He said, "What are you doing Wednesday?" I went, "Nothing." He goes, "Well." Here's my number. He says, here's my address. Come on over Wednesday around 11. I want to do some demo tapes. So I, I, I drive into uh, Port Credit, Mississauga, and the houses are getting bigger and bigger, and they're closer. <laughs> so a freaking mansion. Oh, oh, this is nice. Yeah. And, you know, and I knock on the door, and he come, and there's, there's, there's Grammys and Mamas and Papas posters all over the place. And, like, and I, oh, I got it right away. I went, yeah. oh, okay. And, <laughs> 17 years later, man, we were pals. We, we, we had a lot of fun. He was a really good guy. Oh, wow. You did some songwriting with him. You were instrumental in a, in a CBC documentary, right? I wrote nine songs with him. Uh, co- well, you know, arranged, helped him write. And uh, when he died, CBC came to me, and they said, look at, uh, you know, you got some stuff that you do with Denny. I said, yeah, I got hours of it. He went, We'd like to lease it for a documentary called Here I Am, that came out a few years ago, and I wrote Here I Am with him. So that oh, was okay. Good. So it's too bad it all happened after he was gone, though. Uh, just before he died, I talked to him about doing, uh, you know the Traveling Wolverines? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to do the same thing, but Canadian. Mm-hmm. So I said, Denny, I got a good idea, man. This would be huge. Why don't you get, like, you and Bruce Coburn or Murray McLaughlin or whoever, you know, the Canadian guys, yeah, and, yeah. and get four of you Get Zell Yanofsky on guitar, who is a friend of ours. Get Zell on guitar. Get a bunch of guys together. 
let's let's do a tour and and we'll be like we call it the Mugwumps because Mugwump was a name that they were originally going to call the Mamas and Papas. Mm -hmm. They're going to call it the Mugwumps. And he went, oh, great idea. I love the idea. I'm going to Ohio. I'll be back in a week. And I, you know, four months later, he'd call me back. And then he kept disappearing. And he would go and do these things. And he'd come back up to Canada. And I never worked with a lot of people over the border. I only worked with them up here. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to get over there. Really hard to get over there. So did something happen to you that uh, made it hard for you to go over there? 2001 was 9-11, right? Yes. Well, I got a call from Tim McGraw, his agent, saying... He's going to be in Rochester doing a show. He needs a guitar player. Would you be willing to drive over to Rochester and audition? Yeah. yeah. So I got in the car. I get to the border, and this big cop with the friggin' sunglasses, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going over to Rochester. What are you doing with them guitars in the back? Yeah. Uh -oh. oh, I'm going to audition for a band. No, you're not. You're going to work. <laughs> here's, a, here's a piece of paper. Go in the office. So they retina scanned me, fingerprinted me, they did everything to me, sent me back, and they would not let me over the border. Yeah. So I had to wow. phone and say, I, I can't make it, guys. Oh. I, was so, I was so mad. That's a pretty big gig. Tim it, would, it, would, it would have changed my life. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I got lots of those stories, man. I got yeah. lots. So we talked a lot about you being in backup bands, but you also... Uh, led your own band, you know, doing a lot of festivals and stuff like that. You've opened for a lot of big-name artists. You've opened for uh, Lee Von Helm, B.B. King, uh, 10 Years After, Jimmy Vaughn, Dr. John, John Mayle. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we would get a, a really amazing opening slots at a lot of the blues festivals in town. And wow. In between here, Orangeville. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but I, I was on the ground floor of the Kitchener Blues Festival. I did the first, I, I used to book the entertainment for the first three years. The whole idea of that festival it was supposed to be uh, for handicapped kids, like a, a charity. Right, sure. Yeah, and they didn't like to give the money away, so they got rid of me, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get to play with some of them? After our parties, um, my fondest memories are when we were doing, um, like, London, Windsor, Thunder Bay, we, we'd, be, we'd be traveling around and we'd be opening up for a lot of the big guys. Sometimes we actually back them up, like Phil Guy, like Buddy Guy's brother, uh, people like that we actually played with. Um, we Roy, I was with Roy Young, who you probably never heard of. Nobody knows who he is, but he was the original piano player for the Beatles. Mm. He played with him in 62 uh, and, and Ham, uh, at, at the Star Club in Hamburg. So we were hired to go up to Thunder Bay and do a show with Eric Burden. That was pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, and, the uh, animals. Sometimes, sometimes at the end of the night, uh, there'd be an encore. We'd get up and you'd, you'd sit in and everybody play together. It was, who knew? You know, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was good good days. So we've touched on a lot of different styles. I mean, you're really a versatile player. You know, uh, funk, uh, blues, R&B, jazz, and country. So when it comes time to practicing, are you dividing yourself up so you keep your chops up on all these different styles? I don't I don't notice a difference from one kind of music or the other one. I think it's all it's there's only there's only 12 notes and it's what you do with them. Right? No, I really believe that. Like I mean, I'll be playing I'll, in one afternoon I'll I'll just put on YouTube and jam out with whatever I'm watching. <laughs> commercials and i don't really think there's a big difference the only thing that i can't do is read and i can't play mm -hmm. classical i do have a good classical story though i was it was a very very wealthy woman living in cambridge and she wanted me to play her uh, backyard party being a gig pig like myself i don't turn anything down yeah you know. sure so anyway she calls me up and she says can you play my backyard party can you play nylon string guitar i said yeah and i didn't own one so i went down to the local pawn shop and i bought this 89 dollar alvarez yeri <laughs> and i put some really good strings on it and i mean i was getting a few hundred bucks for this gig it was a good gig and uh so i got the classical guitar and of course you have to sit a certain way to play classical yeah, yeah I I got, so for a half an hour i went <laughs> I just played that for about a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
And then and she said to me, well, would you mind uh, walking around my backyard? And, this is, you know, you know, <laughs> you know what strolling is. Yeah, okay. strolling so musician, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Playing the same thing for another half an hour. And she says, oh, that was really lovely. We're so <laughs> glad we had you. Paid me and I went home. That's like the Tommy Tedesco <laughs> thing. You've seen that, Tommy Tedesco. My hero. Yeah, yeah. Like, I read it. Yeah. Where he talks about doing the Spanish lick, and it's like it's, it's, it was the same. That's right. It was the same one over and over again. <laughs> over and over again. You know. It was John Denver in Mexico, and they wanted some. He was on a fishing vessel, and they wanted some Mexican music. So I give him this. Charlie's Angels, they were in Puerto Rico. They wanted Puerto Rico music, so I gave them this. You know, bullshit baffles brains, man, I'm telling oh, you. Oh, shit, that's but my it, dad's line. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true, you know. Yeah. If you have a suit on, if you, if, you, if you look real good and you got your suit on, you got your Rolex on, and you have the, you know, and you got the, you got the whole attitude. Yeah. People, people see what, okay, there's an old saying, people hear with their eyes sure people don't know really what you're doing they hear with their eyes so if there's two guys on stage there's two sax players on stage one is amazing he's like the best player in the world and he stands there looking like paint drying and then another guy can play three notes he's on his back jumping around acting like a maniac who's the guy that's going to get the gigs yeah, sure. you know, everything is visual now in the social media world. I mean, you can't go on Facebook and just post a still picture of an album cut. You know, just play an MP3. Uh, you need you need a video. You need something for people to look at. Well, I want to answer a question you asked me earlier. I'm sorry, I, I, I rambled. No, go away. ahead. Roy Clark. I was uh, I, I saw Roy Clark on Hee Haw and Beverly. Well, actually, before that, the Beverly Hillbillies, and he was cousin Roy. And he was playing that great big Gibson Birdland, and he was playing under the double ego, and he had the short pants on, and you know, and he was making the faces. And I saw him when I was about seven or eight, and I thought, this guy is cool. This guy is really cool. So I wanted to, I wanted to be Roy Clark, and then a little later, wanted to be Glenn Campbell. Yeah, Glenn yeah. Campbell came out; he was the coolest when he came out. Yeah. But of course, being an Italian guy with a big friggin' fro. I couldn't comb my hair and part it like Glenn Campbell, so <laughs> I tried to part it on the side. So I had this fro with a part in it for a while, you know. And I look, I look kind of silly, but anyway, I was a really big fan of those guys when I was, you know, before this is before the Beatles were really big, you know. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, no, it's around the same time, '65, '67. Beatles were big, but I kind of went a little bit country then too. I liked it. Now that you're talking about Roy Clark, I, I recall on your Facebook. Um, seeing some uh, a signed picture addressed to you for, from Roy Clark. So, so I'm, I'm assuming you met him, or how did that come about? This is about four years ago. I was standing outside of a Starbucks in Burlington, and I was going in to get myself a coffee and, you know, something to eat. Gordy Tapp comes walking over beside me, and I, and I said, how you doing? He goes, oh, pretty good. And I said, I, we, I think we got a few mutual friends. And he said, oh, yeah, who do you know? And Gordy was 91 at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. So... He had nothing to do, but he was interested. He, he wanted to talk. So I, I mentioned some of the guys I played with, and he was pretty happy to hear about it. And he went, oh, yeah. He said, so what do you do? I said, well, I play guitar, and I got a little studio down the road. And I said, here's my card, and if you ever got nothing to do, come on over, and uh, I'll show you the studio, and we'll hang out and have a coffee. About two weeks later, I get this phone call, and it's Gordy. So Gordy comes over. Anyway, he sits on the couch, and he tells me some jokes. And then he says, oh, I got to go. And, he, you know, he stays about 20 minutes and he leaves. Well, he was doing this on a regular basis now for over the next few weeks. He would come over, tell me a couple of jokes, tell me some stories, and he'd leave again. One day we're sitting on the couch in the studio and he said, uh, he said, well, listen, kid, how did you get into this? And I went, well, I saw Roy Clark on uh, Beverly Hillbillies and later on on your show. And, you know, I lost my mind. I wanted to play like Roy Clark. He said, hold on a minute. He pulls out his cell phone. He phones Roy. It's like, what? Oh, I'm like, what? I got to show you. Can, 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 you, can I? Yeah, yeah, this? yeah. So Roy mailed me this. Oh, that's awesome. Well, re read it out to us because we can't see it. It just says, any fr it says to Jim, 
Any friend of Gordy's is a friend of mine. Oh, that's great. You're kind of an El Paladino. <laughs> and he came into the Sanderson Center in Brantford. We went to see the show, and I went up and talked to Gordy and, and uh, went up on the bus and got this signed. Oh, that's awesome. So that was a, that was a cool day. Yeah, yeah, very game. cool. He was a monster player, and then, of course, Hee Haw had tons of monster players on it. You know, oh, he, that, I heard that, some great stories about that show. Oh, yeah, um, those, those guys like to like to get a little high. You didn't think you didn't think about those guys that way, did you? Did you guys just drink? No, no, no. <laughs> more, more of that going on. Yeah, I could imagine. But I could see Jerry Reed getting high. <laughs> no, I think he'd probably be an animal. Just, yeah. He was an incredible player. So you mentioned your studio a few times, and, and, and you're in it now. Do you hire yourself out as a producer, mixer, and uh, you know have, uh, have people come in to record? I stopped doing that about, about a year ago. Uh, all through the uh, 90s, I had a real studio that I rented out hmm. in Cambridge. I did a lot of car commercials, jingles. I did, I did the uh, Fantasy Island Fun Wow. I did the Bad to the Bone for uh, Blue Note Jeans. I mean, so I did a couple of good ones anyway. Uh, Trey Stella Cheese, I did, okay. I did their commercials. I, I did some serious commercials for a while. And then I did a few here when I was living in Burlington. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of those ones, you know, you hear the car, com the, the dealership commercials where you hear a little finger picking in the background. The guy's talking about an F-150 or, you know, I've done some of that stuff and, Cool. Um, and then I started bringing bands in, like a bands would come in and they would say like, you know, what do you charge for the afternoon? And I would, I'd let them come in. I had a drum kit set up. I would try and help them get sounds, but this is the problem. They would have their rhythm section, which weren't experienced at all. Okay. So there's always the lead singer guy was probably the best in the band. Most of the other guys were just okay. They would come in and do these really bad CDs. And then when they couldn't get any any luck with them, they blame me. Well, it was just all. <laughs> uh, he's not very good. It wasn't mastered right. <laughs> well, how do you tell the bass player and drummer guy guys? You know, you, you, like let me let me bring in Bucky and Jimmy and let me bring in the A team and do the rhythm section stuff with them, and then you can bring your guys in and finish it up. But they wouldn't listen to me, and I got sure. to the point where the projects were just awful. And, and, and there's nothing I could do to, to make them good. So I got, into, I got into doing a lot of acoustic stuff, like songwriter stuff, which I like. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just them on a stool, playing acoustic guitar, singing. You know, you throw a little dobro on there and it's done. Yeah, you nice. know, but, but nice. bands, no. I'm, I'm yeah. afraid of bands. It's scary. <laughs> well, the, the band wants to do their own thing. They don't want somebody to take their chair, right? Well, you, you better have a good bass player and drummer, I tell you, yeah. or, or it's pretty scary. Well, let's talk guitars now. You know, you've been in and out of owning some stores. You've acquired a lot of stuff, picked up a lot of stuff on the road. Uh, I've talked to you before about gear. you got some really good stuff. So share with us some of your gems. Going back uh, to my early stuff, I had a beautiful uh, 68 Black Beauty Les Paul that weighed a ton. I, I don't know how I played it. I, I have no idea. I played it for 20 years. I have no idea why. <laughs> it sounded great, but, I mean, your back would be killing on you. I was in Peterborough playing back in with Jay Douglas back in the 71. And remember Pat Travers, the guitar yeah, player? Yeah, of course. Okay, well, Pat was with a band called Red Hot, and the bar had two floors. And I was playing on the upstairs floor with the soul band, and he was in the basement playing with Red Hot, three three piece, you know, heavy rock band. And it was like Tuesday morning, I believe, and he was sitting outside with a Hagstrom, and he was sanding it the top down on it. I kind of said, "What are you doing?" Oh, I'm sanding down my guitar. I'm going to paint it white. I said, "Oh, cool." So you mind if I join you? So I got my '68 Les Paul and sanded the top off. So you know. I got a spray bomb from Can a Canadian Tire and sprayed it. It was still tacky when I took it on stage that night. I had to be careful. <laughs> anyway, so I had that guitar. Um, I owned an original Epiphone Casino 64. Uh, I had a, a one pickup Firebird that Pat Rush sold somebody, and they, they traded me that belonged to Johnny Winter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he played with Johnny Winter. Yeah, and I had a green Telly 61. Hunter Green, and this is, I can't prove this, but I'll tell you the story anyway. Right up, up here, was messed up real bad. You could tell some it was left-handed, or it was right-handed. Somebody tried to make it left, and they, 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 
they buggered it up, you know. So I bought that guitar for like four fifty. And I sold, you know who bought it off me? One of the guys from the Stampeders. I think he okay. still got it. I found out years later that it might have been one of Hendrix's because he used to, when he played country in Nashville, before he made it really big, he played in some in some black country bands back then. He lived in Nashville for a couple of years. Hmm. He had a green, hundred green telly that he flipped over. Sure. And I, that might have been that one. It, that one came from Memphis. A guy named James Burney owned it, and I, I bought it off him so that, that might have been his. That's you know, cool. who knows? Yeah, but you know what he did with it? He 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 sanded he sanded it down and painted it silver, like the original <laughs> sixty one original hundred green and painted it silver. This is my my fifty seven. Um, this is the uh, hardtail. That's it's awesome. Got that, it's got the Layla neck. I call that the Layla neck, right? Yeah, yeah. Because all these things were worth two hundred bucks until Layla came out. And overnight yeah. they went up to like two grand, and then they went to like twenty thousand and crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a keeper. This is a nice one I still got. This is my I, I sixty seven with a flame. It's got a flamed uh, neck on it, and that one I bought with a Fender Twin in nineteen ninety for twelve hundred bucks for both of them, the Fender Twin and this. And I've got a, a sixty four three thirty five, the BB King signed. Oh, nice. And, uh, that's wow. that's awesome. That's cool. wow. And the Roy Clark, the Roy Clark one. But I think my pride and joy is this one here. Uh, when I turned, when I was 59, I was in Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And uh, you ever heard of Bob Benedetto? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, he's he's like, he's, he's considered the Stradivarius of now. The Stradivari. Anyway, I, I ordered this guitar. It took a year. And uh, I got it for my, my 60th birthday. This is a wow. beauty, beauty Benedetto. This is the right. cat's ass. Yeah. Wow. Is that that's an ebony uh, fingerboard on it? Looks really dark. Yeah, and and this is a, a, all all the guitar player guys are gonna love this because there's no markings on it. There's no yeah. dots. So you better know where you're going on that sucker. But what is there markers <laughs> on the? Is there markers on the top? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like the feel of of anything on the fingerboard. I really don't yeah. like. You know, I had Gretsch's that had. Those great big block inlays. Oh, yeah, yeah. They look good, though. They look cool, but I don't like my finger on the plastic. I, I want to feel wood. Yeah. And I have really I have really high frets. Not so th – they're not really wide, but they're high. And I use 11s. I okay. use 11s, 10, 10 and a half. Um, Acoustic-wise – oh, I do have a really cool acoustic i got to show you. Okay. Um, this is a 1955 J185. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is original. Holy see cow. The whole thing here. Looks in it's, amazing condition. Yeah. The condition looks incredible. Well, you hear, I'll tell you the story why. See the back? Look at the flame on that. Yeah, yeah. Spinal tap guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have to look at it. Don't look at it. What happened was, uh, I can't prove this story, but I tried. I have a really good friend of mine, Ron Coleman, who, who actually played bass for the Everly Brothers. And I asked Ron uh, if this happened, and he kind of remembered it. In 1980-something, the Everly, Everly Brothers were playing in Lulu's. And Donnie and Phil used to fight like cats and dogs. And one night, the story goes, that thing would have had two pickguards on it. Right now, right. it's been restored. So he got the guitar. One of them swore at the other one and got pissed off and broke the guitar, smashed it. Somebody, the janitor, somebody picked the guitar up and took, took it home. Because it was hmm. all smashed. body was smashed on it. And uh, had the guitar for about 10 years. And in 1990, 91, I was in my little store in Cambridge, and this guitar came in. It was a garbage bag with a guitar neck sticking out. <laughs> it said Gibson on it. <laughs> the guy goes, hey. Oh, yeah. The guy goes, hey, buddy, when I want to buy a guitar, he says, it's broken, buddy. Give me 100 bucks." I said, <laughs> I said, oh, think about it. I said, it's pretty busted up. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. And give me, instead of giving me the cash, just give me credit. So I gave him 100 and a half in credit, and the guy went around the store. He went and got a bunch of stuff. And the guitar was pooched. Yeah. I mean, the back, I don't know if you can see the, the uh, line there, but right over right over here. There's a great big line on the back there. Okay, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad that that didn't look better. But the guy that fixed it used the wrong stain. The neck was good, so he put the whole guitar back together. Uh, a guy named Donnie Carter who lived up in uh, Stratford, he was one of the best guitar, what do you call it, luthiers. Right. So Donnie came into the store. He was coming down to Toronto every once in a while to buy supplies. He used to go to the wood places and buy really exotic, the exotic wood, you know, to build build guitars with. 
So he came in the store. He had one look at it, and he said, I'll give you two grand for it right now. I said, why? He goes, that's a 1955 J150, J185. I said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I want to keep it. I just want to get it fixed. So he charged me around a grand. I had to wait almost a year, but I got it back, and he completely – he, 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 put, he put it together like toothpicks. He wow. put it all back together. He put a brand new top on it because uh, the top was done. It was smashed okay. right in. And the sides and back weren't that bad. He just glued them all together. He braced them. And I got it back. And uh, that it's a very rare guitar. They only made 11 of those. Oh, and wow. I, do believe, I do believe it belonged to Don or Phil, one of those guys. One of oh, that's guys. a great story. Yeah. yeah. Well, guitars with stories are, are the best. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I couldn't prove it. I can't prove it. Yeah, yeah. So what what are your favorite amps that you use? Three. I have a Trinity. You ever heard of Trinity? No, I don't. Tell us. Okay, Stephen's going to love me. Uh, a guy named Stephen Coors, he lives in uh, Belleville, and he makes a Dumble clone. Oh, Dumble wow. copy. He makes Fender tweeds. He does plexis, and they're like two grand, 25. You know, they're not, they're not out, out of this world. Right. And... One thing I don't understand about a lot of guitar players is, and I'm not, I'm not being the cranky old guy, but like, <laughs> why would if you're a really good player, save your money up and get a good guitar and a great amp? Because sure, you know, you, here you are with your three thousand dollar Telier Strat, and you got your, you know, you got your Blues Junior, which costs like four ninety nine, which is okay. I use one, yeah. but if you're really gonna go for it and you really want to do it, get yourself something really good. Sure, so sure. Trinity amps are, are, are amazing. Uh, another one I've got is a Fuchs. You're okay. A Fuchs? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I've sure. got that's a Dumble clone, and um, I use I use a, a, a souped up Blues Junior, and I've got one. I just bought one called the Supersonic. Now uh, what I what I like is six V sixes. I love six V six. The sound of those. I'm using Eminent. I've got an endorsement with Eminence. I've had okay. that for like yeah. twenty years. Very lucky. I've got an endorsement with Godan, Eminence, uh, Reverend Guitars. Like I've been pretty fortunate oh, wow. to have that. So I get some cool stuff. Check out Trinity Amps and go on, go online and uh, and have a look at them because they're they're amazing. They really and wow. he, he'll make you anything you want. You, you order it, you wait a few months, and you know he makes it for you. You can afford yeah. them. You know. So so that one, the Trinity one, is a is a Dumble copy, like a steel stringer. Sort of, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of a, it's a deluxe reverb. It's like the clean, the clean sound of a deluxe, and then the dirty sound of a dumble. And I forgot another amp I, I, I just picked up about a year ago, which I, I, I forget because I haven't been playing much in, you know, for a couple yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the new Fillmore, uh, it's a Fillmore 25 made by Boogie. Okay. It's, made, it's a deluxe. I love deluxes. So do you. I can see you going yeah, behind yeah. you. So I love the deluxe, and I like the fact that you don't need pedals, and you can go click and go to your overdrive. I don't use a lot of overdrive. never have. Yeah, yeah. You know. Which is kind of a good thing because um, you, you, it, it sounds great to the player, but when you're listening to the song, it, it fuzzes out too much yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. I think you got a, a really good advice to the younger players coming up is 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 play the song. Never mind about your guitar. Like I mean, everybody can play guitar, and play lots of licks, but but if you make the song sound really good, you're going to work all the time. Yeah, because singers will love you. They'll, they'll, they'll hire you. That message is told over and over again by experienced players. You know, I, I guess there's, you know, in your career of playing, there's this line you cross over where you got the confidence that you don't have to play everything you know all the time. You know, you don't have to constantly be proving yourself, and you can relax and just kind of focus on what makes sense for the song. George Harrison was was, was one of the best at that. I mean, he always played the right part. Right, you know? right. Yeah, sure. A lot of those guys. Um, and, you know, some of my favorite players are really tricky, and they, and they, play, they, can, they play all over the place. But when, when they need to, they can play really pretty, too. Like, I, 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 uh, I had this weird uh, thing in my mind when I was young that I had to meet all my favorite players, and if I shook their hand, maybe <laughs> like get this much mojo 
from them. It, it would rub off on you. So I'm, I'm the luckiest guy that ever lived because I met T-Bone Walker, Mike Bloomfield, Albert King, B.B. King, all those guys. And later on, uh, Albert, Albert Lee, uh, Red Bull Card, I, I, I got to hang with them all. And it's like you, you just want to get a little mojo from each one of those guys, you know. <laughs> I met Vince Gill twice, but it hasn't worked for me. <laughs> I met him. I met him. He's a nice guy, you know. Uh, the only story I got about him is in – in the early 70s, I got a call to, from an agent that said that there's a really good bluegrass band coming into play. It's one of those places in Toronto, like the Midwich Cuckoo or, you know, you know, one of those little clubs, basement that's, clubs. That's before my time. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is like 70, yeah. 78 or something, 77. Anyway, the band was called Boone Creek. And just for fun, do you ever heard of, you ever heard of Boone Creek? No, no. Oh, this will uh, this uh, the way. It, it was Vince Gill on guitar. Jerry Douglas on Dobro, oh, Ricky shit. Skaggs, and Keith Whitley. Oh, my God. Four of them, making 75 bucks, 100 bucks a guy, playing this crappy little bar in Toronto. Oh, and I got to Google that. There. Oh, it was amazing. We were there the whole night hanging with them. Ricky didn't drink. Vince did. Drink. Vince had a beer, but nobody else would. And uh, I remember sitting there at a table with a bunch of these guys, and we're all sitting there just talking about the scene. And, and it's really funny because Jim Carrey was there, but nobody knew who he was yet. He, was, he wasn't even like, a, you know, he, he'd never done anything yet. Right, he just right. started out. But it was an amazing night. I, I have a good memory. I remember stuff like that. So in addition to uh, playing for the song, what other advice could you give out to some younger players who are uh, looking to make a career out of music? Well, the first, the first thing that worked for me, once upon a time, I just play guitar. I just want to be Jeff Beck. You know, I want to be one of those guys. It, it, I was playing some, you know, some band gigs and hired hired gigs. And one day I just ended up with, it was, you know, one of the, the, the whole thing fell apart. I had no gig, nothing. And I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I know 20 songs. I know maybe 25, 30 songs. So I, I sat down and wrote them all on a piece of paper, the songs that I kind of knew how to sing and play on acoustic. Now, I, I, I walked around into these little bars around, you know, I lived on Broadview and Danforth at the time. And I went into some local little coffee houses and I got gigs playing acoustic and singing. It doesn't matter how good you can sing. I mean, you don't have to be a good singer. I mean, no offense to Bob Dylan, but hey, come on. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you know, I mean, he, he has this thing. And Willie Nelson, you know, all those guys have, have a voice. It might not be a, a perfect voice, but it's, it's their signature. So mm -hmm. even if you sing just okay, sing. Like, write songs, learn how to sing, learn 30 songs, go do single gigs. You can make more money in a pinch doing a single than you ever will mm -hmm, being in sure. a band and playing in a small bar in a band with a band. Because the clubs are not going to pay any more money for four guys than they are for two or one. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I learned that the hard way. But I, I can make a really good living playing four nights a week doing a single. I don't need I don't need the hassle, and uh, I love playing with a band. I mean, I'm fortunate to play with some of the best guys in, in in Toronto, but they also have things that they're doing. And what happens is, you know, everybody everybody their own path. I mean, even though they're playing with you and you got a bunch of gigs for them, if they get fifty bucks more, they're gone and they're playing with somebody <laughs> else. It's true, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. And you can't get mad at them. I did. No. I used to get pissed off, but now I go, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, you got a you got a blue society thing, and they're paying you twice as much as I can. H have fun. So yeah, I've yeah. Ha I've had to have two drummers, two bass players, because if that guy can't do it, this guy might be able to. They all know my material. And then, and about a year ago, about two years ago, I guess, I just said, you know, I'm just going to go out. If I have a situation like that, I'm just going to go out and do it on my own. Mm -hmm. and, and, man, the most money I ever made was playing festivals as a single. Hmm. Do like an, an hour show. Opening, I opened up for Bobby Bland. I've opened up for uh, Johnny Winter. Like everybody doing a single. Just by yourself, eh? So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Playing slide and, and being like the Delta. I can, I can wear two hats. I can be the Delta guy. Or I can be the Merle Haggard guy. I'll whatever you want. I'll yeah, do it. yeah, that's great. It's all the same thing anyway, it's all. I guess w Wendell had done the same thing, right? He he kind of did uh, kind of did the the folk comedy thing as a as a single or a duo, and it was kind of for the same reason, you know. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, there was a time in the uh, '90s where I used to play the whole chain of yuck yucks. 
you know, Yuck Yucks comedy. Ch- uh, well, I used to go around and be the opening guy on on Friday and Saturday, where I would go on around eight thirty, and I would play while everybody was shuffling to get in. Yeah, and I'd, I'd play like a forty five minute set, and then the comedians would come on, and they'd go on till about eleven o'clock. I'd play the last half hour and go home. I yeah. did a ton of those, and I met all the com- I met a lot of comedians doing that. Like sure, in sure. In fact, I'm hanging out with guys. You know. Yeah, no, that was a big club for a while here in Toronto. Well, there was a bunch of them. There was one. A bunch in, of locations, yeah. Hamilton. I mean, there was one, I think there was one in Brantford. There was a Niagara Falls. There was a bunch. I did the whole, yeah, I yeah. Did go from one to the other, you know. It was a great was place a to take time. a date. <laughs> yeah. If you weren't funny, you took them to a comedy bar. They laughed to be in a good mood. It was a great time. <laughs> but you know, what, you know what I noticed? The, uh, most, most, most comedians are pretty miserable guys. Oh, They're sure. Yeah, well, we've seen that. So thanks a lot, James, for uh, for hanging with us on Guitar Players in Isolation. I hope this all passes and you don't need to be isolated. Uh, but I've asked all my other guests to uh, do their isolated lick. So if you could play, like, you know, a short, a short phrase with a bit of an explanation, that'd be great. Okay, I'd love to. James, that great lick. That was awesome. Thanks so much for your time. The whole idea of my program was to spotlight guys that are local to the GTA area with had tremendous careers over the years. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, I'm sure lots of people will enjoy it. Well, thank you. My pleasure being here. I'll make sure to come out to uh, the Abbey Arms or the uh, Uptown Social. I'll bring your guitar with you. By the way, uh, if, uh, if I can say this, go to uh, jamesanthony.ca. Sure. You'll be able to find out wherever we're playing. It's always on there. Yeah, no problem. I'll put that in the description on the on the video. Hey, thanks, Ari. Well, that was great meeting James Anthony. Thanks so much to him for spending some time with us. I hope you enjoyed uh, the interview. So check around on my channel because this was the 10th interview. So there's 10 interviews in total with guys that have had incredible careers that are all based out of the Southern Ontario area or originated uh, from this area. And if you like what you're watching, please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification button. And once again, special thanks to the music store in Brantford, Ontario, called Axe, and you will receive. I really appreciate you sticking me on your website to help promote this series of videos. Anyway, we'll see you again next week for another great one.